And now they decide to tell us all about when she gave birth. Um, now, of course, they didn't want the press to have anything to do with it. Although, historically, when one has a baby, the press is informed of the event. They were not interested in letting those horrible hounds of hell into their private moment. Meg was a week past her due date. The press kept wanting to know, when's the baby coming? When's the baby coming? And Harry was like, oh, you know, oh, the press is frustrated. Oh, how hard for them. Heaven forbid it. Um... Meg's doctor had tried several homeopathic ways to get things moving, but the little baby just didn't want to come. Probably he knew what, what world he was coming into. So after trying to induce labor, they couldn't get anything started. They decided that they would just go in and see the doctor. Maybe the doctor could give them, you know, a little bit of more advice. He says that they got into a nondescript people carrier. I don't know what that is. And crept away from Frogmore without alerting any of the journalists stationed at the gates. It was the last sort of vehicle they'd expect that we'd be riding in. A short time later, we arrived at the Portland Hospital and were spirited into a secret lift and then into a private room. Our doctors walked in, talked it through with us, and said it was time to induce. Meg, Meg was so calm. I was calm too. But I saw two ways of enhancing my calm. One, Nando's chicken. Bought by our bodyguards. Two, a canister of, of laughing gas beside Meg's bed. I took several slow, penetrating hits. Meg bouncing on a giant purple ball, a proven way of giving nature a push, laughed and rolled her eyes. That's what makes me know she wasn't in labor. No one's laughing and rolling their eyes while your husband is stuffing his face with Nando's chicken and taking all the laughing gas, which was meant for you. Anyway, he's over there just taking hit after hit between the bites of chicken. Her contractions begin to quicken and deepen. A nurse comes in to give Meg some laughing gas, but there's none left. I mean, what is this admission of Tom? Fo Can you imagine having that clown in the corner chewing on a chicken leg, taking all the gas? Can you imagine, I mean, like, when you are in the throes of labor, you can barely concentrate on breathing, let alone having some fool in the corner sucking the grease off his fingers and giggling into his handkerchief. All right, so the nurse looked at the tank and then looked at me, and I could see the thought slowly dawning. Gracious, the husband's had it all. Sorry, I said meekly. Meg laughed again with the laughing. Who's laughing when you are at the point of contractions where you're needing some sort of intervention? No one's cackling and laughing at the funny little clown in the corner. It's what the hell? You took all the gas? Meg laughed. The nurse laughed and quickly changed the canister. I hope it was charged for the canister that he took. Meg climbed into a bath. I turned on soothing music. Okay, apparently she wanted to listen to this individual called Diva Primo. She remixed Sanskrit mantras into soulful hymns. Primo claimed that she heard her first mantra in the womb, chanted by her father. And when he was dying, she chanted the same mantra deck to him. Powerful stuff. If you were high on laughing gas, you'd buy that. Um... He writes that in their overnight bag, they had some electric candles that he'd arranged in the garden the night they proposed. They still had those clunky things. He put them around the hospital room and he also set a framed photo of his mother on a little table by Meg's head, which he says was Meg's idea. You guys, can you even? I just don't know. I mean, my, my own mother had passed away by the t before I had any of my kids. And I am not an unsentimental person, but it never even dawned on me to get a framed photograph of my mother to make sure was on the bedside table when I gave birth. I mean, as much as I would want her there, like it would only make me sadder that like the best I can do is this picture on the bedside table, but she's missing this moment in my life. I've, I have three kids, not for any of their births, but they're like, oh, and into my overnight bag, I need to make sure that I put a picture of my mom. Now, if any of you all did that, okay, that's fine. I'm not trying to mock, you know, maybe that was sentimental and, and special for you. But, like, 
I think it's just because Harry can't ever let go of the idea of his mom that I find this definite, definite overkill. Um, but I guess it's better than him, you know, putting a box of hair next to the bed. Um, anyway, Meg's in a lot of pain. She's breathing deeply, but the breathing exercises stop working. Well, I mean, the breathing exercises aren't going to stop the pain. It's, uh, it'd help you get through it, but she needed an epidural. So, um, an anesthesiologist comes in. Harry writes, off went the music, on went the lights. Whoa, vibe change. What a grating statement. Whoa, vibe change. He gave her an injection at the base of her spine. Still, the pain didn't let up. The medicine apparently wasn't getting where it needed to go. Even the epidural was against her. Doctor comes back, gives her another one. Can you have more than one epidural? I guess you can. I don't know. I didn't have any. After that, things started working. Um, he writes that the doctor came back two hours later, slipped both hands into a pair of rubber gloves. This is it, everybody. I stationed myself at the head of the bed, holding Meg's hand, encouraging her. Push, love, breathe. The doctor gave Meg a, a small hand mirror. I tried not to look, but I had to. Wait, what? Okay, when I was in the throes of labor, pushing a child out, you could have, I, I, I couldn't have held a hand mirror or positioned it so I could have seen anything. What is he talking, what, what doctor is being, okay, hold this mirror while you shove this baby out. Doesn't, like, I couldn't, I was too weak. My legs were shaking so bad from the pain. I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't have held anything, let alone a mirror positioned down there so I could see the crowning of the baby. I mean, I just have to believe it's happening. I don't need to see it. And quite frankly, I wouldn't have wanted to see it. I couldn't have pushed any if I was actually looking at what was happening down there. The doctor gave Meg a small hand mirror. I tried not to look, but I had to. I glanced and I saw a reflection of the baby's head emerging. Stuck. Tangled. What an odd word to use. Tangled in what? Oh no, please, no. The doctor looked up, her mouth set in a particular way. Things were getting serious. I said to Meg, oh, oh, right, 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 tangled. Oh, in the umbilical cord, sorry, duh. I said to Meg, my love, I need you to push. She's got a doctor there. And by the way, you can't just be pushing willy nilly. You better be pushing with a contraction. You're gonna tear yourself from stem to stern. I didn't tell her why. I didn't tell her about the cord. I didn't tell her about the likelihood of an emergency C-section. The baby's right there. I don't think you need an emergency C-section. I just said, give me everything you got. And she did. I saw the little face, the tiny neck and chest and arms wriggling and writhing. Life, life, amazing. I thought, wow, it really all begins with a struggle for freedom. <laughs> This guy cannot get off the narrative. A nurse swept the baby with a towel, places the baby on Meg's chest. Um, their special doctor had advised them that in the first minute of life, a baby absorbs everything said to them. So whisper to the baby, tell the baby you're, you're for him, your love. Tell, we told. He says he didn't remember phoning anyone or texting them. And I think that that's so sad. You just had a baby and and you're so cut off from your family that you didn't, you don't recall phoning anybody or texting anybody. It was just you and Meg in the hospital alone. And then, okay, like on the one hand, I didn't want a whole crowd in my, in the room when I was giving birth. I only wanted my husband. I didn't want my sisters. I didn't want any mother-in-laws. I didn't want any aunts, nobody. Y'all can wait in the, waiting room and when the baby's here, you can come see. The only person I wanted was my husband. This was a moment between, between him and I. And I mean, I don't need a crowd at the end of the bed. But as soon as that baby was born, I wanted to celebrate. I wanted everybody to know. I wanted to send pictures. I, if anybody was in the waiting room, please come in, see the baby. Like how sad that you would have this beautiful moment, your first baby, and you would just be at such odds with everybody that you wouldn't even phone or text. Boy, she has really done a number. Done a number. Um, 
So he says that they, their nurses ran some tests on his hour old son and then they were out of there. I mean, they didn't even spend the night. Into the lift, into the underground car park, into the people carrier and gone. Within two hours of our son being born, we were back at Frogmore. The sun had risen and we were behind closed doors before the official announcement was released. That's also very suspicious. Would they release you two hours after having the baby? Maybe they do things differently in England. Do they, do you have the choice to go home that quickly? Usually they want to just make sure everything's okay. Like just at least have you stay overnight. Just make sure, you know, you know what you're doing in the nursing department and all this. I mean, if you're choosing to nurse, maybe she wasn't choosing to nurse. Oh, look, okay, I know, I, I see the comments. I know there's all this conspiracy about, did she even have the babies? You know, was there a surrogate and she had a fake baby bump? I don't know about all that. I've never gone down the rabbit hole of that particular conspiracy. And it seems such like a wild thing, but you know, crazier things have happened. Um, so I'm not, I know that this video is going to get lots and lots of comments of, she wasn't even really pregnant. Oh, how do you believe this? Oh, that was also fake. You feel free to leave those comments. You know, you all know more about the subject than I do, but I do want to just remind you that I'm only reading this book based on what he's telling us, but even what he's telling me, I'm like, you really haven't experienced someone giving birth, have you? Um, anyway, they get back to Frogmore within two hours of having had the baby. And he says they immediately already had a tiff with Sarah, their comms girl, because she said that she writes to him and says, oh, has Meg gone into labor? <laughs> has she? She's already had the baby. And Harry says, look, I told you she's not in labor anymore. And Sarah was disappointed because she's like, look, but the press wants this dramatic um, lead up and a suspenseful story. They demand it. And, and, and you're, you're wrecking that, you know, you could have at least told us that she was in labor. You could have at least given us that little bit of excitement. And Harry's like, oh, I'm not giving them anything. Um, so he's like, I'm not going to lie and say that she's in labor now when I know full well, she's back in the house with the kid. And so Sarah's kind of hoping that he'll, you know, release something. Oh, she's in labor. And then, oh, she had the baby. And, you know, I'll post the event. But basically, Sarah was of the mind, you know, let's keep people tuned into this show. And he didn't care. And anyway, after a few hours, um, he was standing outside the stables at Windsor telling the world, oh, it's a boy. Days later, we announced the name to the world, Archie. The papers were incensed. Because they said that Harry and Meghan had pulled a fast one on them. <laughs> Indeed, we had. They felt that in doing so, Harry and Meghan had been bad partners. Astonishing. Did they still think of us as partners? Did they really expect special consideration, preferential treatment, given how they treated us these last three years? And then they showed the world what kind of partners they really were. A BBC radio presenter posted a photo on his social media, a man and a woman holding hands with a chimpanzee. And the caption read, Royal baby leaves hospital. Okay, but you aren't partners with them. They've always been your arch nemesis. Are you, I mean, well, except second only to William. Are you really shocked that they would do something like this since you say they're so hateful anyway? Like, why are you continually shocked by these people who you say are your persecutors? 